Do you remember? Yes. I think we walked in over there. That's it, yes. I remember it exactly. It was December 2012. Darkness, burning torches, our kickoff. I'd been at Porsche for a while. For you, it was one of your first impressions since you had started. Everything was new, yes. It was shortly after the management board had decided on our return. I was simply looking at what was already in place, that means infrastructure, people, regulations. And at the time, there was really nothing at all. The particular appeal, if I understood you correctly, was to be responsible for an entire vehicle. That was the dream. In all aspects. Absolutely. That was the dream. Simply to be responsible for the entire car. And being able to do that for Porsche was the icing on the cake. For me, it was important that we set a mark, a mark that shows what makes us different, and this had to be from the kickoff. From there, it had to be clear to everyone that things were going to be different. A big round of applause for our boss, Mr. Matthias Müller. I think it's great that you're meeting in this historic Wagenhalle today to celebrate this kickoff for the months to come. And I'm absolutely certain that we will win in Le Mans for the 17th time and have a huge celebration. Do you remember what Dr. Porsche said to you that day? Yeah, when saying goodbye, he simply said, welcome to Porsche, just in his friendly way. After an hour of conversation, it was one of my personal highlights. By now, you usually appear as a trio. That means Alex Hitzinger and Andreas Seidel are by your side permanently. Alex Hitzinger, as technical director. I met technical director Alex Hitzinger and simply felt he was the right man. Andreas Seidel I knew from Munich and was certain that if I went to Stuttgart, he would follow at some point. And that's how I found him. I only really got to know endurance sport after BMW retired from Formula One. I think that anyone who's experienced these 24 hours, seeing the sun rise on Sunday morning in Le Mans where their race cars are still running, knows how exhilarating this can be for a team. I've been involved in motorsport since university. I worked at Red Bull and before that I was working for Cosworth. So I've spent a long time in England. I always wanted to build a project at the top level of motorsports from the ground up. And when the opportunity came to do that with Porsche, a company with such prestige, it was the ultimate project for me. I didn't know Fritz Enzinger at that point. We got along very well right from the beginning. In this project, I really had the opportunity to start with a blank sheet of paper. But in my head, I already had everything worked out. The concept, the structure, and the personnel structure. I knew what we needed in terms of infrastructure, and that's how it began. On the first day, I think, I registered with security, picked up my ID and my company car. Let's just say it wasn't a particularly attractive color. That was my first surprise. What color was it? A sort of chocolate brown? Okay. What I noticed straight away on the first day, or let's say over the first few days, was that people who work for Porsche are extremely proud to work here. I think this was very positive and that the working culture here is very, very good. Do you think this might be a reason why the development management team decided to keep the motorsports project within the premises of the development center, despite the difficulties involved? I think that was one of the reasons for keeping it there. If you see the motorsports project as part of the overall development process, you can create certain synergies. 
I think the challenge was to involve all the people who had come on board in an effective way, the Porsche way, because there were a lot of different types of experiences to bring together, both from within Porsche, as well as the experience that the people brought from outside. The concept developed bit by bit, and parallel to the regulations. Because only when you have the regulations can you know your pros and cons, and find the right compromise. Because every concept is a form of compromise. When making the individual concept decisions, it was important to know which way we were headed. Are we set on reliability and durability, or are we taking a more aggressive course that has the obvious advantage of reaching the top of the field faster? It was clear that it was going to be a hybrid vehicle, and that in a way the hybrid system was the heart of the vehicle. This was something we defined at the very beginning, which meant taking certain risks, in some cases very big risks. But if you really want to go for maximum performance, then that's the path you have to take. Developing a hybrid car and getting the maximum lap time performance through the hybrid system. I would say that it's probably the most innovative and complex racing vehicle in motorsports worldwide, simply because of its technology, such as the four-cylinder turbo engine, the exhaust energy recovery system, the very powerful lithium-ion battery, the high torque on the front axle, meaning all-wheel drive. All these are technologies that we've developed completely from scratch and that you'll largely only find in our vehicle. That means it's a vehicle with a large number of completely new developments, and it's generally very complex. We have two energy recovery systems. One uses kinetic energy, as known from Formula One, but using exhaust energy was a complete novelty, and we're the only ones out of all four manufacturers in the WEC who use it. So that means the WEC is the only racing series where you can use two energy recovery systems. Correct. Technologically, it's on the highest level. Would you say that the LMP is more complex than a Formula One vehicle? It's more complex because there's considerably more freedom. As soon as an engineer has more freedom, he takes things closer to the limit. The race distances are also much longer. Six hours in the WEC and 24 hours in Le Mans. In comparison, the distance covered in a 24-hour race is roughly the same as covered in an entire season of Formula One. In Le Mans, you cover around 5,300 kilometers. In Formula One, each of the 19 races covers 300 kilometers, which adds up to almost the same. That's something you have to understand. I have to say that the 12th of June 2013 was indescribable. The team was coming together, we had more than 150 people, and we had moved into a new building. My aim had always been to develop the entire vehicle in one building, simply to avoid fractions forming among the engineers. And so when the car moved on the skid pad in Weissach for the very first time, you couldn't really call it driving yet, you could tell that the responsibilities hadn't been fully defined yet, and it was quite adventurous. This is where we drove the very first meters with our vehicle. After months of preparation, months of building up the team and the infrastructure, we put this complex vehicle into operation for the first time. So far in the workshop, we'd only been able to start the engine and shift through the gears. It took us a few days until we actually got the vehicle to drive in a straight line. 
At the time, it really didn't look like the vehicle or the team overseeing the rollout on June the 12th would win Le Mans just two years later. We had a problem with the output shaft between the engine and the gearbox. It broke a few times when we started the engine. And it took us a few days until we managed to put in solid and consistent laps. Who was the driver? Timo was behind the wheel. It was important for us to have a driver in there who had experience in LMP1. I think Timo as well expected the whole thing to be, let's just say, a lot better. You could see in his face that he was quite disappointed in the beginning. We have a lot of electromagnetic interference which is making things difficult for us. It's something you can't simulate in all of its complexity on the test bed. Additionally, we had a problem with our first engine specification, which gave us really high levels of vibration in the vehicle. This, of course, was very distracting for the driver. I think at the beginning, our drivers, including Timo, weren't always quite sure if we were on the right track. Of course, the engineers, designers, and mechanics have a huge influence on the car, but the driver has a considerable say, too. We tell the engineers what we feel in the car, and ultimately, everything has to be just right. This makes cooperation very important. And I can already tell, even with this new team, that there's a special team spirit. It was a very frustrating phase. The first five months between the rollout and the aforementioned test. At the rollout, or at the beginning, I was pretty much alone with my point of view. In my opinion, the only way to solve the vibration problem was to make major changes to the engine. More specifically, to change the firing order of the engine. This meant a new crankshaft, a new camshaft, new gas exchange and so on. I had to do quite a bit of convincing to unite the team behind this decision. But when we introduced the new specs, it was Eureka. Suddenly it worked. The driver felt the handling of the car. Parts weren't breaking anymore. And you could put in five, six, seven, eight hundred kilometers in one go. This was a turning point. A turning point for the entire project. Suddenly, everybody said, okay, now we're ready to go. Because that's where the development of the vehicle really begins. From your point of view, what role do the drivers play? For me, the driver has two roles. On the one hand, they're part of the performance package. We put an enormous amount of work into developing the vehicle and maximizing performance. And the driver is part of this. On the other hand, the driver helps to develop the vehicle, and their constructive feedback is very important. Das 
natürlich. Selecting the driver squad is very exciting, especially in a new project. Ultimately, the drivers are an essential component, which can determine failure or success. With Roma and Timo, we were lucky to have very experienced drivers who were already racing for Porsche in the GT team. The next one to join was Niliani, who we noticed due to his excellent performance in Rebellion, the private LMB1 class in Le Mans. He was also the sort of guy we were looking for. He has a very strong personality, and it was clear that he would fit in perfectly at Porsche. Mark Weber was already clear at an early stage, directly after deciding that we would return to Le Mans in 2011. He's fast and obviously a great guy. Fritz Enzinger and I already knew him from our time at BMW. That meant we had four drivers, and then we gave Mark Lieb another chance to test at Paul Ricard. He's one of the fastest in the GT squad, and of course, he had also been a Porsche driver for a long time and was therefore a perfect candidate. We took a bit more time with driver number six. Of course, we studied different race series intensively and conducted detailed analyses to find the talent we were looking for. And in the end, It was Brendan Hartley who sent us an email at his own initiative, in the same way that a mechanic or engineer would submit a CV. And he simply asked us if he could have a test drive, as he believed he was the right man for the team and this project. Brendan's simulator experience was certainly interesting, but the most important thing was his commitment and dedication to the project, as well as his consistency. And of course, it's important that the guys work well as a team, that they're all team players and understand what it means to be competing alongside two other drivers in endurance racing. It's a completely different challenge compared to conventional formula racing, where a single driver receives the entire focus of the team. The most difficult phase of the project was the startup and the testing before the first race. We were improving from test to test. At the same time, however, you go into a test with a list of 10 things you want to improve, which you've compiled from the previous test, and all of a sudden you end up with a list of 10 new problems. This means we were never able to look back on a successful experience over the entire test phase, from June 2013 up to the first race in April 2014. And it was very difficult keeping team morale high during this time. And of course we had a few dramatic tests too where we suffered severe setbacks and had to abort early. At the same time as a team, We never took our eyes off the goal. We always had the first race in Silverstone in mind. And as a whole, I think we coped very well. Welcome to Geneva and welcome to Porsche. Geneva was something special going public for the first time. The fact that we choose a major motor show to launch our new motorsport campaign shows you just how important it is to us. Presenting the car at a top-class car show is the highlight of the Porsche stand with all other manufacturers and simply seeing the response. What will it be like? What will happen afterwards? It was a great moment. It is the car that takes Porsche back to endurance racing and Le Mans at the top level, back where we belong. For us, Geneva marked the public start of our mission 2014. I think it was a sensational sign of commitment again on Porsche's part. It really isn't usual to present a 919 hybrid as the main car at a top-class auto show. At the same time, everyone felt the pressure to deliver. And that in the first year. With these cars and these drivers, we hope we can make history again. Thank you.
links weiter nach Paul Ricard. Then we went to Paul Ricard, the first time for the car running alongside competition. Did it turn out as expected? The prologue at Paul Ricard was really exciting. It was the first time that we were on track with the other manufacturers and competitors. Simply not wanting to embarrass yourself, the show that things run smoothly. The tension was huge, and you could see that the mechanics and engineers, as well as the managers, were very nervous. A baptism of fire for the team, then? Absolutely. A baptism of fire in public, which went well gave us reassurance and I have to say that this in itself made the next few days so much better. Silverstone 2014. Overall, I think we performed very well. It wasn't an easy race. Conditions kept changing which posed an additional challenge for our drivers as well as our race engineers. Unfortunately, car number 14 had to retire quite early. But we already knew from testing that we couldn't be 100% sure of its reliability. Important for me in Silverstone was to see that we weren't too far off pace. It was pretty clear that we weren't going to be competitive here. But if we'd been one and a half or two seconds behind the rest of the field, it would have been a setback. And that made it even more pleasing when we achieved our first podium finish with car number 20. Finishing third in the very first race, it was a great reward for all the hard work in the months before. Of course, the result boosted the motivation of the entire team. It was a very important race for us. In Le Mans 2014, everything was different, especially the preparation. Part of that was the race before at Spa, where we took our first pole. So we knew the car was fast, but would it last the distance? And then, the run-up to Le Mans. The logistics involved. The tension. The technical inspections. There were so many tense moments even before we started the car for the first time. Think back to Le Mans 2014. The cars are on the grid. All board members are there. I reckon we had over 700 invited guests in addition to the 240,000 spectators. The tension in Le Mans 2014 was unbearable. The last couple of hours before the race it just got worse, at least for me. And just like you said, the tension and the expectations were huge. We knew the car was fast, but the reliability just wasn't there yet. It was our third race. The months leading up to Le Mans had been dominated by preparation, so when it actually started and our car was part of it, it was a special moment. We had both cars starting from front row, which was obviously a highlight of our first Le Mans weekend. 
on. Then the race started and we experienced a couple of problems quite early on. But all of a sudden we were doing well, no more problems. Tire changes, fueling, driver swaps, all running smoothly. Looking back now, I can say that our own expectations were pretty low because we'd never actually managed to drive 30 hours in one go during our run-ups. It was very important to me that we showed that the car was on one level with the competition. That's why the qualifying was so important. The first people have then about six to eight hours before the end of the race, some people started calculating. If it keeps going like this, then we'll finish there and there, podium, etc. At this point, I still kept saying, I don't want to hear any of this. And then we had two more hours to go, and I caught myself starting to think in the same way. These last two hours shouldn't be the problem. And then, bang, bang, problem. 15 minutes later, bang, next problem. Both cars in the garage. And it was extremely disappointing. Absolutely devastating. Losing both cars in such a short time so close to the end of the race. It made it very important for us to prove that at least one car could finish because our aim in Le Mans 2014 had been to show that the car was fast and that we could keep running until the end with at least one car. I think we were all realistic enough to know that this would only work with repairs. The car was pushed back into the pit garage and it was sensational how both car crews worked together and repaired the car in record time. It was a very special moment simply because the entire Porsche board came into the pits. They were all there, and each of them expressed their gratitude for the performance we had delivered. The feedback from outside was just as good. We were praised for our first appearance and for being capable of leading after 22 hours. I think you could see that even as such a young team, we were in a position to fight. I think it shows the fighting spirit we have at Porsche, and it gave us encouragement for the future. The first half of the 2014 season had been dominated by preparations for Le Mans. Once it was over, we simply had more time, where we conducted new test runs with a new quality. Overall, there were three test drives before Austin, and that's when we realized that things were on another level. Even though the results were nothing special and our performance was still somewhat disappointing, you can say that Austin was the beginning of a steady improvement. We simply got better from race to race, and then we set off for Sao Paulo.
erste Rennen. Sao Paulo was the first race where you can really say that we dominated the race weekend in terms of performance. And where you could see that we were very, very competitive. The Sao Paulo circuit suited us very well. It had a lot of grip. But just like in the previous races, for example in Austin, problems can occur any time. And you can never relax. So the race went on, and our performance basically matched what we'd shown in qualifying. And shock. shock. First, uncertainty. Okay, what's happened and how's he doing? Quite honestly, my first reaction when seeing the images live in Sao Paulo was to question the purpose of it all. Is it really worth risking the life of a driver just to drive around in circles really fast? At the same time, at least this is what I do, I switch on a sort of protective mechanism and change directly to a mode where I get on the radio and remind the team to stay sharp, we can't do anything about the situation out there right now and we need to stay alert. We might need to conduct a pit stop for the second car just 10 seconds later. The impact was 100 Gs. It's a lateral impact of 100 Gs. That's a lot of force. I met Mark two days later in the hotel. Not a scratch. As an engineer, I can't imagine a bigger commendation when it comes to safety. That's true. That was extremely positive. You can give yourself a small pat on the back, and I think it was recognized very positively by FIA. I think that it also led to our monocoque being regarded as a benchmark when it comes to safety. Was it important that we won in Sao Paulo in 2014 so we could start the winter break with confidence to continue development? Yes, I think the victory in Sao Paulo was hugely important. Firstly, it proved our design and that we were on course technologically. Secondly, it was a confirmation for every engineer that we can do it because we won the last race under our own steam. And with the motivation from our victory in Sao Paulo, we went into the rollout of the 2015 vehicle on December the 15th. The test had gone really well, and I believe this was ultimately the key to our success in Le Mans. So we finished the 2014 season pretty successfully, went back to Paul Ricard and presented the new vehicles in three colors. The first time I saw the pictures of the cars in three different colors, one white, one red and one black, I was hugely impressed. In terms of logistics, it's an additional challenge to have the necessary amount of matching spare parts ready in Le Mans. Worst case, we might end up having a car on the circuit with a white nose, a black rear wing, and a red middle section. The expectations for 2015 were considerably higher. It was known that our tests had gone well, that the car was quick, and this made Silverstone a completely different start into our second season, with corresponding expectations. It was great to see that Mark was back to former strength at our first race in Silverstone. Unfortunately, we had to retire his car due to gearbox damage, meaning that they couldn't bring home the reward they deserved for the hard work in winter. At least, not with this car. Thank <laughs> you. 
Then we went to Spa, where it was clear that the track would suit our level of downforce. And we clearly had the fastest car there, and qualifying proved that. But we simply couldn't deliver in the race. We had technical problems, we had operational problems. We simply didn't run an efficient race. And that's why we didn't win. Even though we had the three fastest cars, the fourth fastest car, the Audi won. Personally, I was very disappointed. But I saw it as a wake-up call and communicated this to the team very clearly. We certainly hadn't covered ourselves with glory in this race, and we really needed to pull ourselves together. Le Mans 2014 was a test, a dress rehearsal. We went there knowing it was unrealistic to expect victory. In 2015, we went to Le Mans with one single aim. We had to win. Anything other than victory would have been a huge disappointment. And I know that in my position, in one way or another, I would have to take responsibility for failure. We were confident enough to paste our brand core on the car, Porsche Intelligent Performance. Do you think it was justified? Yes, it was definitely right to put it on the car, because the decisive factor for the success and performance of the car is its intelligent overall concept. It can get so close to the cars, I mean, it's like, like nothing you've ever seen before. I think it would be a difficult race for sure. This place is just something special. There's nothing else on the planet like it. This time we started in Le Mans with three vehicles. We had six drivers throughout the entire project. And then there was, I don't want to call them outsiders, but let's say a rookie car with Nico Hülkenberg, Earl Bamber and Nick Tandy. Two youngsters and a Formula One star. First of all, the integration of the third car was very important. We managed it well. The preparation time was also important. We had four 30-hour tests and then used the third car in Spa for the first time to make sure that all cycles ran smoothly. The first few laps are always a very intensive phase. The beginning was uh, was nice. I could take the lead. Throughout the night, we had managed to extend our lead on the competition by nearly one second per lap. We just uh, made a small mistake, so we have to change the four nose. It's going to be a long 12 hours fighting it out in the front. Way to go, 
it's about the time that uh, that last year we were also in P2 of fighting for the lead and we had the issue so I hope it will not occur. We have a good run, uh, we have good pace, now the, you know, the excitement is so high, the adrenaline is pumping. We had about 30 more minutes until the end, and I don't know how you felt, but I felt like a six-year-old before a big school test. The last 30 minutes were almost unbearable. Yes, I have to say that when you look at the television footage of the last 30 minutes or the last hour, you can see the tension, simply knowing that you're so close to winning. I noticed in the pits that there were a few people who started to enjoy the moment a little earlier. Audi, for example, came into our box a few minutes before we crossed the finish line to congratulate us. Matthias Müller on one side, Dr. Wolfgang Porsche on the other. And just this feeling. We could really get that 17th victory. You know you're so close. You're listening to the radio. Are there any problems? No problem at all, chap. What do you do? Got two minutes left on the timer, so we need to be slower than two minutes to the start of finish line. Pace is okay, mate. Pace is okay. It's the final lap. Final lap. Gentlemen, we are right in three, baby. <laughs> Crew 19, congratulations boys, well done. Immediately after the checkered flag in Neymar, I remembered that I congratulated my crew chief who was next to me on the victory. And anybody who knows our crew chief also knows that he is even less emotional than me. Cross my heart. The cars crossed the finish line, and I had tears in my eyes. I have rarely seen so many men cry. I was crying myself. I think I started crying even earlier. The last few minutes, I think, I was already out of control. But I have to say, I'm not ashamed of a single tear. It was so emotional. But that's why we do it with such passion and emotion. Everybody's life revolves around achieving the success. And for the first time I could see in my crew chief's eyes the sheer delight at what we had just achieved in Lemur. And it meant so much to me to see how these lads would work so hard day and night for two years for this success. How pleased they were about what we had achieved there. The fact that the third car won was a complete surprise. I don't think anybody expected the third car to win. So it was a great surprise and also somehow really, really nice. I was extremely happy for the three drivers. During the week in Le Mans, and of course during the race, this incredible tension builds up in your body. You're completely stressed. And in my case, it took more than a day until I could really enjoy the victory and relax. I had already been fortunate enough to stand on the podium last year in the last race in Sao Paulo. But Le Mans was much bigger. When you look down and see 150,000 people feeling the emotions with the drivers, when you look down and see the team who've been fighting for the success for three and a half years, these are very special moments. And I think you can count yourself very lucky to have experienced them. Wait, wait, wait.
we're pleased, you can say that. We're pretty pleased. For me, the most important thing after the victory ceremony was going into the pits and having the opportunity to give everybody, absolutely everybody, a hug. It was highly emotional. And then we were in our own hospitality area. The guests were there and things took their own course from there. I can only remember that I was back in the hotel at midnight and I simply couldn't sleep. I just stared at the ceiling and enjoyed those last few moments. The next day I started realizing that was such a major milestone, also for me personally. I put so much blood, sweat and tears into the project. I was very stressed for quite a long time and worked very hard. And I just wanted to reach what for me marked a major achievement in my life. We are a family. A motorsports team is a family. We spend an awful lot of time with each other. We all love motorsports. Why? Because I believe that there is no other business in which you can feel such concentrated emotion, experience so many highlights and disappointments as well, and where you can feel so much adrenaline. For Porsche, for Porsche, being able to take part in Le Mans and then achieving this amazing double victory is something uniquely special. It's the absolute highlight for me personally. And I think the same is true for the many, many others who are on the team in Le Mans. You have to wait the 24 hours before you then may be happy or sad. This time we were happy. The victory in Le Mans certainly gave the whole company a huge boost. Somehow increasing the feeling of belonging together, but also giving the brand an amazing boost. And the acceptance of the motorsports project within the company has grown enormously. Yes, I think it was important to keep our feet on the ground. Because of the way we started the first half of the season, we needed a new goal for the second half of the season. And that was the Manufacturers World Championship. I'm just so proud of everybody. There are currently 260 team members from more than 20 countries, focused, wanting to win. And there's the openness in the team. And the aim is to win again next year. So I think we're on the right track. It's important that we keep our feet on the ground at all times, everyone together, and that we start preparations next year with the same level of meticulousness when headed to Le Mans. We all know that you don't go to Le Mans and plan a victory. You have to work hard for the win. The 17th overall victory in Le Mans. It feels good, doesn't it? Yes, it's indescribable. We set the car in motion for the first time on June the 12th, 2013. And almost exactly two years later, we win in Le Mans. I still can't believe that we already did it in our second year. It's certainly a dream come true. We had an ad made for your birthday. Do you remember what it said? Of course. A lot of people start with a blank sheet of paper, but only a few write history.